The Giraffe and the Belly and Me by Roald Dahl. Part 2. Yes, sighed the giraffe, and that's been my problem ever since I arrived on these shores. That is no problem at all here at Hampshire House, said the duke. Look over there, my dear giraffe, and you will see the only plantation of tinkle tinkle trees in the entire country. The giraffe looked. She gave a gasp of astonishment, <gasps> and at first she was so overwhelmed she couldn't even speak. Great tears of joy began running down her cheeks. Help yourself, said the Duke. Eat all you want. Oh, my sainted souls, gasped the giraffe. Oh, my naked neck, I cannot believe what I am seeing. The next moment she was galloping full speed across the lawns and whinnying with excitement. And the last we saw of her, she was burying her head in the beautiful pink and purple flowers that blossomed on the tops of the trees all around her. As for the monkey, the duke went on, I think he also will be pleased with what I have to offer. All over my estate there are thousands of giant nut trees. Nuts, cried the monkey. What kind of nuts? Walnuts, of course, said the duke. Walnuts, screamed the monkey. Not walnuts. You don't really mean walnuts. You're pulling my leg. You're joking. You can't be serious. I must have heard wrong. There's a ro walnut tree right over there, said the duke, pointing. The monkey took off like an arrow, and a few seconds later he was high up in the branches of the walnut tree, cracking the nuts and guzzling what was inside. That leaves only the pelly, said the duke. Yes, said the pelican nervously, but I'm afraid that what I eat does not grow in trees. I only eat fish. Would it be too much trouble, I wonder, if I were to ask you for a reasonably fresh piece of coddock, haddock or cod every day? Haddock or cod, shouted the duke, spitting out the words as though they made a bad taste in his mouth. Cast your eyes, my dear pelly, over there to the south. The pelican looked across the vast rolling estate and in the distance he saw a great river. That is the river Hamp, cried the duke. The finest salmon river in the whole of Europe. Salmon, squeezed the pelican. Not salmon, you don't really mean salmon. It's full of salmon, the duke said, and I own it. You can help yourself. Before he had finished speaking, the pelican was in the air. The Duke and I watched him as he flew full speed toward the river. We saw him circle over the water, then he dived and disappeared. A few moments later, he was in the air again, and he had a gigantic salmon in his beak. I stood alone with the Duke on the lawn beside his great house. Well, Billy, he said, I'm glad they are all happy, but what about you, my dear lad? I am wondering if you happen to have just one extra special little wish all for yourself. If you do, I'd love for you to tell me about it. There was a sudden tingling in my toes. It felt as though something tremendous might be going to happen at any moment. Yes, I murmured nervously. I do have one extra special wish. And what might that be? said the Duke in a kindly voice. There is an old wooden house near where I live, I said. It's called the Grubber, and long ago it used to be a sweet shop. I have wished and wished that one day somebody might come along and make it into a marvellous new sweet shop all over again. Somebody? cried the Duke. What do you mean, somebody? You and I will do that. We'll do it together. We'll make... It into the most wonderful sweet shop in the whole world. And you, my boy, will own it. Whenever the old duke got excited, his enormous moustaches started to bristle and jump about. Right now, they were jumping up and down so much, it looked as though he had a squirrel on his face. By God, sir, he cried, waving his stick. I shall buy the place today. Then we'll get to work and have a, the whole thing ready in no time. You just wait and see. 
What sort of sweet shop we are going to make out of this grubber place of yours? It was amazing how quickly things began to happen after that. There was no problem about buying the house because it was owned by the giraffe and the pelly and the monkey. They insisted upon giving it to the duke for nothing. Then builders and carpenters moved in and rebuilt the whole in of the inside so that once again it had three floors. On all these floors they put together rows and rows of tall shelves and there were ladders to climb up to the high shelves and baskets to carry what you bought. Then the sweets and chocks and toffees and fudges and nuggets began pouring in to fill the shelves. They came by aeroplane from every country in the world. The most wild and wondrous things you could ever imagine. There were gum twizzlers and fizzwinkles from China, froth blowers and spit sizzlers from Africa, tummy ticklers and gobwangles from the Fiji Islands and lip lickers and plush nuggets from the land of the midnight sun. For two whole weeks, the flood of boxes and sacks continued to arrive. I could no longer keep track of all the countries they came from, but you can bet your life that as I unpacked each new box, 